To put it plainly, failure is an unpleasant experience. To fail means one was not equal to the task, not good enough, or if one was equal to the task, that that task did not reward their competence. But regardless of why failure occurs, people generally do everything in their power to avoid it and feeling inadequate, which makes it interesting that people choose games as their pastime of choice because failure is absolutely integral to them. From losing a relaxed game of tic-tac-toe to an intense mission in Dark Souls, the vast majority of players, if not all, experience failure on a regular basis while playing games. The only true way to avoid failure is not to play the game, yet we almost always choose to do so. Welcome to The Nature of Games. Today, we will be talking about failure, the paradox it creates in games, the effect it has on players, and the various methods in which it can appear. The content of this episode is based off of Jesper Jewell's book, The Art of Failure, which comes highly recommended if you wish to explore this topic further. Games are often infuriating experiences, especially in the midst of repeated and or devastating failure. Questions like, why am I doing this? Why am I submitting myself to this? Why do I still want to play? Bounce around in our minds as we keep bashing our heads against the challenges games set before us. This contradiction of deliberately exposing ourselves to failure in games when we know it creates unpleasant emotions is the failure paradox. 1. We generally avoid failure. 2. We experience failure when playing games. 3. We seek out games, although we will likely experience something we'd normally avoid. It's extremely similar to the paradox of painful art like tragedies, where we intentionally witness events that we know will upset us. And it's not as if we begrudgingly tolerate this unpleasantness so we can enjoy the rest of the experience. We want the unpleasant emotions to be there, even if we don't like them. When a tragedy isn't sad enough or a game doesn't make us lose enough, we actually hold a more negative opinion of the overall experience. In an experiment conducted by Jesper Jewell, he found that players who didn't lose any lives while playing a provided sample game, on average, rated the game's quality lower than those who had completed the game but lost at least once, so there must be something about failure in games that creates a better experience. But what? As stated in the beginning of this episode, to fail means to have not been good enough. However, to succeed after failure is to have mended that inadequacy, to have learned. We may have an immediate moment-to-moment -moment aversion to failure, but at the same time we harbor a longer-term desire for the game to beat us so we can grow and get better. We wouldn't be disappointed to discover that doing the dishes is too easy. But this is not the case with games. Unlike a forced task such as household chores, we willingly play games specifically for the satisfaction of overcoming challenges. Games are a magical space where the regular rules we set for ourselves get flipped on their heads, where we embrace failure just as much as we despise it. But while we may accept losing as a core component of game experiences, that doesn't mean that everyone has the same reaction to it. No matter the mental gymnastics we do to wrap our heads around failure in games, it still sucks. We still have to cope with the fact we didn't succeed. And there are a few angles we approach failure from when it happens. Internal versus external. My fault versus the game's fault. Stable versus unstable. I forever suck versus I can still improve. Global versus specific. I'm bad at everything versus I'm bad at this game. Games aim to invoke certain responses from players so that when they inevitably fail, they still desire to play. If a player feels their failure reflects poorly on their general intelligence, and there's no room to improve, they will become totally unmotivated to play because they feel helpless against the horrible feeling of failure. 
So games strive to foster an environment where players both believe they can get better and that said improvement will lead to success. This also internally pins the responsibility of failure to the player, because it is only through feeling responsible for failure that we can feel the satisfaction of being responsible for escaping it. Of course, some types of failure are easier to take responsibility for than others. So far, we've mainly been discussing failure in a context that suits games based purely on skill. In these games, success comes through having the necessary skills to win. But not all games are strictly a matter of skill. On the opposite end of the spectrum lie games of chance and probability. Dice games, lotteries, coin flips. Losing in these types of games marks us differently than games of skill. Instead of feeling personally inadequate, we feel we are at the mercy of powers beyond our control. The only way to dispel this cloud of poor luck is to keep rolling the die until it shows us the number we want to see. With games of probability, there's always that lingering possibility of success. Failing due to chance implants the belief that the odds will eventually be in our favor, and finally having the number go one's way may not fix a personal shortcoming, but it sure feels like it. The switch from an absence of luck to an abundance of it is an intense high. And while it is out of our control, we still feel ownership over it. However, not all games are strictly chance or skill. Many are a combination of both where players have to navigate the probabilities of the game with their skill set in order to win. Even then, this perspective does not cover the entire spectrum of games, for there are games that require neither skill nor luck to succeed. Games of Labor These are games built around trivial tasks that rarely end in failure. They are more about accumulating abilities and powers to do even more trivial tasks both faster and more efficiently. Win-lose states are often entirely absent, meaning success and failure depends on the player's personal goals. You can't win or lose digging at dirt, so failure takes the form of having not succeeded at the next target, the next goal. And because we are often self-aware that games of labor require very little skill or luck, we feel apathetic when we fall short of what we set out to do in them. It doesn't hurt to fail, which means games of labor are often the ideal choice when players seek safe satisfaction. Ultimately, choosing to play a game in your spare time is taking an emotional gamble on how much failure you're willing to tolerate. Sometimes we just want to sit on the couch and relax. Other times we seek crazy challenges to test our skills. But regardless of whether skill, luck, or labor is center stage, the abundance and variety of failure in games is what sets them apart from other mediums. Upon losing, people often say, it's just a game. That's because what transpired had no tangible consequences. It had no meaning. But in reality, it is precisely because there are no tangible consequences that games are full of purpose. Because it is just a game, we can fail without the fear of the consequences it would usually bring in real life. The only way not to fail is to not play. That's why we play as much as we can. Thanks for watching. The Nature of Games is written by Benjamin Mora Davison, illustrated by Zirin Ma, and narrated by Chupi Choosy Chazaria LLC back in the clack. This episode was based off of Jesper Jewell's novel, The Art of Failure, which you can check out in the link below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again in the next episode of The Nature of Games.